I'd rather be a professor at a university when I'm 40 than play music. So said the offspring's Dexter Holland in the 90s. Fast forward to 2021 and he's one of America's biggest punk rock stars and a fully qualified scientist. I caught up with Dexter and offspring guitarist Noodles to discuss their new releases, touring plans and a rock career that spanned nearly four decades. <laughs> uh, Dexter and Noodles, you are here on Europe on the leg of your Let the good, Bad Times Roll tour. So you nearly said Let the Good Times Roll, well, but yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. quite, a, quite a confusing one. Um, now, it's your 10th uh, album, and it's one that's come out and taken nearly a decade to come out. It actually, I heard it was quite hard to, to birth. You initially um, started composing for it in 2015, and then obviously a lot of things happened. You, you hadn't predicted that a pandemic was going to, sure. to take place. Um, what was your, the term bad times? What do you mean by that in the title of this album? In a way, it seems kind of self-explanatory, right? I mean, things obviously seem not great right now, but you know, it's not just the, the pandemic, which is on everybody's minds. You know, during this time and before this time, there's been a lot of uh, uh, social, social injustices, social pressure, um, uh, political upheaval, stuff like that going on. And it just kind of, it feels like everywhere you look around, it's like, oh my God, how could it get any worse? And yet somehow it kind of does. So it, it seemed like a very appropriate title to put on, on the album. And I think kind of even more than that, it almost makes you smile in a way, you know? It's like, you have to laugh or you're gonna cry, I guess. So uh, it, helps you, it helps you cope, right? Which sometimes music uh, does a good job of. What kind of moods were you in at the different stages of writing this album from you know, 2015, 2016, recently? <laughs> yeah, it, it took a long time, you know, and we were doing a lot of things, you know, during that time as well. We tour every summer um, and, and, you know, for at least like three months out of every year. And when we're doing that, we don't, we don't get in the studio and record or really even think about what we're working on. We just focus on the live show. Dexter went back and got his PhD. We were very proud of him. Did. Thank um, you for being proud. Congratulations. That, that, Thank took you. Some, that took some time. Um, but really, the, the, just creatively, we didn't really start firing on all cylinders until about two years before the release of the record. Really, a lot of things just kind of came together. And then the pandemic hit. We were getting close to being done, and the pandemic hit. And we're like, well, God, we don't want to release this into a void. You know, yeah. what, you know we can't go out and tour on it. And so we, we made sure, we just kind of polished everything up. You know, But at some point, we realized the, the record's done. we got to put it out. And um, well, as you just said, Dexter, you just got your PhD in molecular biology. Congratulations on top of being a rock star. That's not an easy fit. Uh, so, um, like, so you spe specialize in virology. Yes. And, uh, how did you see this COVID-19 pandemic coming? Were you like, oh my God, or were you very interested in it, you know, oh. as a scientist? Well, from a science standpoint, yes, it was very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, in a way you can almost, especially with all the talk going around in the, in the scientific community, it's like, oh my gosh, we should have seen this coming a long time ago. And so, you know, I, I hope that it's a warning to put more, uh, more efforts into basic research because it actually looks like a lot of this could have been prevented and hopefully we could prevent different uh, outbreaks like this in the future if we spend a little more time uh, studying viruses. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of fun takes on some of your classics uh, in link to this uh, pandemic. Obviously, Come Out and Play uh, got a little revisit to you got to get it, get vaccinated, go get vaccinated. That's which right. Which is very cool. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, your drummer couldn't or wouldn't, to, to use your words, uh, get vaccinated. So you had to remove him uh, from your tour. This led to headlines like, why don't you get a jab, which was also... I mean, funny, but how hard a decision must that have been for you uh, as a band to, 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 to do that, you know? Well, it was rough. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we, you know, really went back and forth with him for a long time, and he was either unwilling or unable to, to get vaccinated at the end, and we couldn't, 
we, we looked at every scenario and we just kept coming into roadblocks. Everybody needed to be vaccinated. One unvaccinated person could have been disastrous to the whole tour, you know, and, and put the whole tour and, and everybody at risk. So we just couldn't, in the end, we couldn't take an unvaccinated drummer or any, any member of the crew. Anyone who wasn't getting vaccinated couldn't couldn't come out on tour with us. Yeah, I tell you, it wasn't even so much a personal decision. It was just a... It wasn't a, really our decision. A logistical <laughs> yeah. decision. Like, yeah. you can't you can't travel, you can't fly. There's so many things that you can't do without being vaccinated. Yeah. So it just wasn't able... It just wasn't possible. On the UK tour, you're doing a benefit concert for the NHS, the National Health Service, over there. Yeah. Why haven't you done that? Uh, I don't think you've done that. I've not seen in the US. We don't have a National Health Service in the US, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <laughs> You know, yeah, we, it, this was presented to us and we, and we thought it was a great idea to give back to, to those people that that really have done the most to, to get us through the pandemic, you know. And, and so we've given out 600 tickets to frontline workers, nurses, EMTs, cops, uh, f food delivery people. And then all the proceeds are going to the registered National Health Service uh, charity. You evoke another pandemic in your album, The Opioid Diaries, uh, notably the the... the fact that so many people get addicted and hooked on opioid uh, medication. Uh, can you tell us a bit about this choice of topic? Right. I mean, that song's about addiction. Mm -hmm. Of course, always awful. Uh, the, the opioid addiction in the U.S. is, is something that seems uh, a, a little more inherent in the U.S. than other countries. And um, just the way it, it sort of come about, we felt like it was different and needed to be talked about because it's almost kind of inadvertent where people are just out doing their daily thing. They're, they're blue-collar workers or they're high school college athletes and they have some minor injury and they get prescribed this medication that they don't realize is so addictive and before they know it they're hooked on opiates and if the prescription runs out there they go and get street heroin or whatever and now on top of that the influx of fentanyl in into the society is killing people fentanyl is so deadly such a small amount is, is, will kill you, and it's getting mixed in with uh, all kinds of drugs, not just opioids, and people are dying uh, like in record numbers like never before. Um, it's, it's horrifying. Back to your recent uh, releases and music on your, your last record, uh, we were talking about the piano-led version of uh, the song Gone Away. Um, so it was a song that came out... Uh, 97 or 90, yeah, yeah. something like that. How did you decide to go for such a softer version or a soothing version of that track? And was that a bit of a turning point? Yeah, it, it, honestly, it was something we started doing live during the set, uh, an acoustic version of it, to just kind of bring everything down, let people breathe. And we realized that by doing that, you're kind of laying the, the emotions of that song bare. And, you, you know, the, the Gone Away may not be the, the most popular song we've ever done, but I would say it has touched people in a more profound way than probably any other song we've done. And those emotions are, are like I said, laid bare when you strip it down and, and to the acoustic version. And the fans loved it and responded positively, and they wanted us to do a, a studio version of it. So, so we went in and recorded it. And it feels, yeah, it feels like the world has grown cold now that you've gone away. It was a fan mandate. Right. Yeah. We need a recorded good. version exactly. of a live track. It's nice that you take requests from the fans. Yeah. I think that's a good one. We try to listen to them. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, you've also got your track, We Never Have Sex Anymore, which is a total earworm. It was like buzzing in my head this morning. We never have sex anymore. We never make love to a sore like we did so long ago. You've also done a French version of it, Guess Who Quit. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, how did you decide to, to do a French version of it and why? There was something about the song. It yeah, just yeah. it just said, "Please sing me in French." I don't <laughs> I don't know if it's the if it's the, the the musical tone or the the subject matter. Maybe it's about a loss of passion, right? I guess I don't know. There was and, something and, about it. And, and the French are stereotypically known as being just super passionate, you know, very <laughs> très sexy, right? You know, and and so to, to sing a song about not you know the the lack of passion and do it in in French seemed kind of like an interesting take for us, you know. People have already warned me, they're like, you know, now that you've released it in French, when you come you know, to France, you have to sing. at least a verse and chorus, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I had a, a lot of help 
uh, uh, from uh, a great French girl who helped me uh, pronounce the lines, basically. But you know, in the studio, I can kind of take it one line at a time and, and get it right. So the idea of seeing the whole thing front to back is kind of daunting. But um, well, you know, we still got to probably got at least until next summer to figure that out. <laughs> that's been also quite exciting is you've been doing YouTube tutorials. Um, so there's been um, how to bird watch, uh, there has oh, been yeah. um, uh, how to fly a, a jet, amazing. Uh, any other things that you're planning to, to do in those uh, you know, offspring tutorials? <laughs> We've got plans. Yeah. We've got plans. We yeah. still have a couple in the can, don't we? We do. Yeah. We were trying to figure out how to, how can we give people stuff to, to, to look at? Like, I was like, well, what can we do? Like, well, let's do a series of videos. We'll call it how to do something odd or random or different. And really, we don't show you how to do anything. <laughs> That's kind of the irony <laughs> That's of the how to. How to catch a wave. Yeah. yeah. yeah not really. But we thought, let's just think of some fun, kind of random things to do. And so uh, how, how to, to open a beer bottle with various objects how to open when, a you, don't beer bottle a, with when you don't have an opener. Very important. You know, when you're on tour, you don't always have access to a, a proper bottle oh, opener. Right. So you have to make do with whatever's in the room. So we kind of explore that. Uh, in that video, but that was a lot of fun. Well, Dexter Noodle, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to you. Thank That's you. So cool. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. <laughs>